Heavenly Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. I'm just thanking you for all that you do, all that you will do, all that you have done. And we praise you, Lord, that uh, you are faithful, even when we aren't. And as we get into your word today, Lord, we just ask for open hearts to receive what your spirit has to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we are in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 5 through 18. Uh, this is entitled, Grace Upon More Grace. Um, as you guys remember, when we were last here, way, way back, we were on Mount Carmel with Elijah, and there was a context, a contest going on between uh, himself and the prophets of Baal, uh, the 450 prophets of Baal, because Elijah called him out, and so he told him, you know, you guys set up the sacrifice that you're going to offer, and I'll set up the sacrifice that I'm going to offer, and you guys go first. And so, like, all day long, the 450 prophets, uh, prophets were screaming to their God and jumping around and cutting themselves and Elijah starts clowning them and joking and is like well maybe he's on the toilet and he can't hear you or you know things like that and then he prayed and he said Lord show them that you are God and we saw that when fire fell from heaven it didn't fall on the disobedient people of God it fell upon the sacrifice. And when the people saw it, they began to shout, Yahweh is God. He's the Lord. And so Elijah tells them, kill all these false prophets, and they killed them all. Now, it hadn't rained, if you guys remember, for like three and a half years. So Elijah tells Ahab, you better hurry up and get in town because the rain is going to stop you. And then it says, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he outran uh, Ahab on his chariot and horses to the city of Jezreel. You guys remember all that? Yes. All right. So I'm just going to read uh, verses 1 through 4, chapter 19. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent the messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow, about this time. And when Elijah saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die, and said, It is enough now, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Okay, so there's a party going on in the city. Uh, Ahab goes and tells Jezebel everything that's happened. And she goes ballistic and sends a message to Elijah that she's going to have him executed in 24 hours. And Elijah took off running for his life about a hundred over a hundred miles away. And then he put in his resignation and told God, just kill me, I quit. <laughs> so he's under this broom tree in the middle of the desert by himself, having a pity party, mad at God. And goes to sleep. Verse 5 says. Then he lay down and slept under a broom tree. Suddenly an angel touched him. And said to him. Arise and eat. Then he looked. And there by his head was a cake. Baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank. And lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord. Came back a second time. And touched him and said. Arise and eat. Because the journey is too great for you. All right, so Elijah is like worn out physically, spiritually, and emotionally. And like a baby, after a hot bath and a warm bottle, he went straight to sleep. 
But then this is where we see the grace of God. And God's grace begin to unfold and literally coming to him as his very present help in Elijah's time of need. Okay, so just thinking back, let's recall. Um, we have seen how the Lord fed Elijah back in chapter uh, 17 by the brook Cherith, Cherith with ravens. You guys remember that? And remember, Cherith was the first place that the Lord sent him, and it means a place of cutting, a separating, a piercing, and a slaying. When the Lord sends us to those places of Cherith, those seasons of our life, they're designed by God to increase our faith in him by piercing, slaying, cutting, and separating us from the flesh unto himself in the spirit. It's in those places where we have to grow to learn to trust in him. So if you remember, after going to Cherith, the brook began to dry up. And then the Lord sent Elijah to Zarephath, to a city 100 miles west across Israel, right into the heart of Jezebel's country. And in Zarephath, the Lord fed Elijah miraculously for a couple years with a small jar of oil and a handful of flour. You guys remember all that? Mm -hmm. Okay, now Zarephath means refining. So after spending some time in Cherith uh, to be pierced, cut, and slayed, the Lord sent Elijah to walk 100 miles across Israel to Zarephath for more refining. Mm -hmm. Both Cherith and Zarephath are the Lord's places of cutting, separating, piercing, and slaying of the flesh for the refinement of our faith. Mm -hmm. In other words, just embrace the breaking for some more burning and scraping. <laughs> See, the Lord is going to keep his promise to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. Anyway, all of this that's been going on with Elijah up to this point, he went boldly in obedience to the Lord to Cherith, where the Lord miraculously provided for him with the ravens. Every day, twice a day, Elijah physically saw the birds coming and he ate. From Cherith, Elijah went in boldly in obedience and in faith to Zarephath. But check this out. In Zarephath, the Lord took him a little deeper. There were no birds. There was no physical confirmations that the Lord would take care of him. In Zarephath, all God gave Elijah was his word. In Zarephath, every day when they woke up, there was more oil and more flour. But now where we are right now, Elijah is not acting bold in faith or in obedience to the Lord. In fact, where he is now, he is where fear has driven him. He's distraught. He's disappointed. He's terrified. And he's ready to quit. All of Elijah's assurance, all of his boldness, all of his reliance on the spirit is gone. And that's because where fear rules, faith is not in operation. Between the two, one must reign above the other because the two cannot abide or coexist in the same place. But in this place where Elijah is, it's in this place of being stretched beyond the limits. He's beyond himself, himself and he has seemingly placed himself outside the will of God. And now he's telling the Lord that he wishes to die. But here, this is not where God does a miracle. In fact, it's here, God did not even give Elijah a word. It's here in this place where he's at the end of himself by nothing but the Lord's grace 
is where the Lord himself literally shows up twice to personally strengthen and bless his child. Hallelujah. See, we read the angel of the Lord. And you remember in the Old Testament where you see the angel of the Lord is always speaking of an appearance of Christ. He had ravens, he had a word, but now this time the Lord has shown up personally. But check this out. The Lord didn't give Elijah a prep talk. He didn't scold him because that is not what Elijah needed most. You know, God always knows what we need most, even when we don't. What Elijah needed most was sleep and nourishment. So he wakes him up, gives him some bread, cooking on some coals and a jar of water. And he fell back to sleep. And then he fed him again. But the thing that tripped me out about this is that Elijah was so used to the miraculous in his life. <laughs> And being in the presence of the Lord, that when God woke him up to feed him, he's in the middle of nowhere under a tree. He didn't trip off a cake cooking on some hot coals and a jug of water that just appeared out of nowhere. He just ate it and went back to sleep. You know, and I was just thinking like, okay, what would I have done? I probably would have had an argument with God. Like, first off, they're trying to kill me. Where'd you come from with this food? What is, what's in this? <laughs> But Elijah's like, okay, thank you, God. I'm going to eat this and go right back to sleep. But the second time the Lord woke him up, he told Elijah, get up, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. Now, in the Hebrew, that literally reads greater than you, the journey is. Our journey that the Lord has given us to walk is greater than any of us can handle. But praise God that the Lord knows this. I mean, that's one reason he doesn't tell us what you're in store for when you choose him. <laughs> Think about it. If he told you everything that was coming next or what was later down the road, you just opt out. If he told you, okay, you got this in your life and I'm going to take you this way to work it out so I can work me in, you'd be like, no, thank you. <laughs> right? I mean, we can work this out another way. But then again, at the same time, because we are self-deceived and prideful in our flesh, often we can start serving God in the power of the flesh rather than in faith. And because we are so self-deceived and think that we're walking in the spirit, we're suddenly surprised when it all falls apart or we get burned out. But that's because the Lord's bread is our daily word in the in daily word from God. And it's empowered by the spirit of God alone. So that we can make it on our journey. See Philippians 2.13 states. For it is God who works in you. Both to will and to do. For his good pleasure. In other words. When we are serving God. And we are walking in faith. And we are moving along. It's not us. It's God who put it in you. Gave you the ability to do it. He's working it out. And it ain't even for you. It's for his good pleasure. But rather the opposition that we face along the way is from self, people, the world, the devil. God's word reminds us in Isaiah 41, 10 and 13 saying, listen, fear not. I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. 
I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And behold, all those who are incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as nothing. And those who strive with you shall perish. You shall seek them and not find them. Those who contend with you, those who war against you shall be as nothing, as a non-existent thing. For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. That's God's word to us when we think, how am I going to do this? I can't do this. Too much opposition. People are attacking. I'm attacking myself. I quit. He says, fear not, I'm with you. I put it in you to want to do. You pray for patience, not because you wanted patience, but because I wanted you to have patience, so you asked me for it. Now you got all the stuff in your life that's going to build your patience. In verse 8, so Elijah arose, ate and drank, and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. Okay, remember, Elijah was in Beersheba under a bush, and then he went to Horeb, which is also called Mount Sinai, and it's in Saudi Arabia. It's about 250 miles or more um, east of Israel's eastern border. Now, that trip from what I read it takes about two weeks on foot but it took Elijah 40 days now in scripture 40 is often equated with judgment or time of testing as in purifying um, in Deuteronomy 8 1 through 3 the Lord says every command which I command you today must be you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you, to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor your fathers know, that he may make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. In our self-sufficiency, God gives us a testing. He humbles us. He breaks us down so that the only thing we can rely upon is what he is providing. And that's so that we will know everything really comes from him. Because a lot of times we think things come from us. You know, one of, one of my kids, he's on this, I don't know what kind of kick he's on, but he's always talking about his estate that he's building and his investments and all this that and the other and how he's so set and and I'm thinking like all they got to do is come and take it like you haven't done anything you know you, you're, you're putting your trust in yourself but that's not where God wants his kids he wants us to know that everything he's given us has come and come from him and to trust in him. Anyway, when God brought the flood, it rained 40 days and 40 nights, which was both a judgment against the world and a purifying. Israel wandered in the desert for 40 years, which was also a judgment and a time of purifying and testing. Jesus was in the desert for 40 days, but it wasn't as a judgment or a purifying in his case, but it was a approving our confirmation that he is the holy God not to himself but for us and of course the devil so at this point Elijah he's on this 40 day trek across the land for a deeper refining and preparation for what God has for him next 
for us, it's just be encouraged. Knowing that when the Lord tests us, his tests are not a matter of pass or fail. They're for purifying and refining. It's for calling us deeper. Okay, so remember going back to the book of Exodus. Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. That's the mountain where Moses first met the Lord in the burning bush. It's also the same mountain that God descended upon to speak to the entire nation of Israel where he handed Moses the Ten Commandments. Now, in Exodus 20, when the Lord, or 19, 20, yeah, it was 19, 20, I'm sorry, 20. In Exodus 20, when the Lord descended on Mount Sinai, the mountain shook, there was a dark cloud, there was thunder, there was lightning, there was a trumpet from heaven, and the people heard and saw all of this, and they were terrified at the awesome presence of the Lord. On top of all of that, Moses also experienced another great encounter with the Lord on Mount Sinai. In Exodus 33, um, Moses asked the Lord, please show me your glory. That's 33:18, And the Lord told Moses to go stand in a particular cave. Then the Lord said, it shall be that while my glory passes, that I will put you, put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Mm -hmm. Then I will take my hand away and you shall see my back, but not my face. It shall not be seen. When he says you will see my back, he's saying you'll see my afterglow. Mm -hmm. And then in Exodus 34, 6, Moses stood in the mouth of the cave and the Lord passed by him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. Mount Sinai, our Horeb, has a great spiritual significance for the nation of Israel. So after eating the second time, Elijah got up and went to Mount Sinai. Are horrid. Now, up to this point, as far as we can tell, the Lord did not tell Elijah to run in the desert to hide from Jezebel. And the Lord didn't tell him to continue running all the way to Mount Sinai. But that's where he went, all the way to Saudi Arabia. So verse 9 says, and there Elijah went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? All right, so the first thing we see is that he went into a cave and spent the night there. Now, in Hebrew, it's not a cave. The grammar of the Hebrew concerning this cave is written in what's called the absolute singular state. In other words, this was not just some cave or one cave of many caves. This cave was speaking of a particular special cave to the exclusion of all others. Elijah specifically went to Mount Sinai to spend the night in Moses' cave where the Lord had passed by him and proclaimed his name. Mm. Mm. Now, as humans, whether we are in some sort of trouble or just in a state of blah or boredom or discontentment with God, we tend to try to get back to the place where we felt closest to God but we do this in opposition to knowing by faith that he's always as close as he's ever been he's never moved now for Elijah 
perhaps one of the reasons why he went there was not only to feel safely out of Jezebel's reach, but perhaps he also wanted to feel closer to God where it all began for the nation of Israel. Whatever the case was, the Lord asked, what are you doing here, Elijah? In verse 10, Elijah said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, kill your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they seek my life. Okay, so Elijah gives God six reasons why he's hiding in Moses' cave. He's like, I've been very zealous for the Lord, God of hosts. That's true. He had a zeal. He was faithfully speaking the word of God. Second reason, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. That's true. They turned away from what God told them. You do this and I'll do that. Here's my covenant to you. Don't worship any other gods. Three, it says they torn down your altars. That's true. On Mount Carmel, he had to rebuild the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. He says, and they killed your prophets with the sword. That's true. Jezebel was on a rampage, killing all of God's prophets that she could find. And he said, I alone am left. Not true. <laughs> Obadiah had already told him, I hid a hundred K, a hundred prophets in two different caves. And the sixth one, and they seek my life. Perhaps. Jezebel, Jezebel may have desired to kill him, but nobody had made a move to do it. See, Elijah's problem was he knew that he was in a spiritual battle. But he had also predetermined within, within himself what the outcome was supposed to be. See, the people who are on Mount Sinai on Mount Carmel were shouting, Yahweh is God. And they were telling everybody what had happened. In Elijah's mind, after this great victory on Mount Carmel, the nation was supposed to go repenting and back to worshiping God. There was supposed to be a great revival in the land. Ahab was supposed to get saved. Then Jezebel was supposed to get saved, divorced or executed. But the great revival Elijah dreamed up didn't happen. Instead of turning from sin, Jezebel threatened to kill him. But think about it. If she thought that she could really kill him, she would not have sent him a message warning him, I'm going to kill you tomorrow. It just would have been done. Right? Right? That's because there really was a revival going on. But it didn't look the way Elijah thought it should. See, the people were already in a state of revival. And they had killed 400 of Jezebel's prophets. And they were shouting, Yahweh is God. Jezebel knew she could not touch Elijah. But check this out. Being the devil, she also knew if she threatened him, he may run off scared and that would stop him in his tracks and he put an end to his own ministry that the Lord gave him. This way, Elijah would look weak and be no longer used positively affecting others to turn from their idolatry and to begin to seek the Lord. And that's what happens with us. We know we're in a spiritual battle. We know we're in spiritual warfare. But then we also tend to come up with what we think the will of God is and what the outcome is going to be like. And that's based upon our own human desires and understanding. I mean, you may be praying for a situation or for certain individuals. And then from our perspective, instead of things getting better and turning out the way we created them to be in our own minds, they appear to take a turn for the worse. 
And then that's when the devil begins to attack with threats. You know, I always hear, if you keep it up, I'm going to get you. Other people hear, now God is going to let me bring your greatest fears to pass. And then what happens? We back off. We run off. We cower in fear. Then the discouragement sets in. And then you begin to hear yourself and the enemy in conversation saying, what's the point in trying? God doesn't care. All of this is useless. Then we cop a got an attitude with God and say, I quit. I'm praying for my kid and they're getting worse. I've asked God to remove my supervisor and elevate me. <laughs> I got laid off. I quit. So we have a meltdown, a temper tantrum. But blessed be the name of the Lord that he's unaffected by our meltdowns. He just says, when you get finished, come here so I can love on you and give you your next assignment. See, it's the goodness and the kindness of the Lord poured out upon us that's intended to turn us from our sin and lead us into repentance. So the Lord, instead of dealing with Elijah's tantrum, the Lord just poured out more grace upon him. Right? He ran away. The Lord wakes him up and feeds him. He runs farther. And God says, what are you doing here? And Elijah goes on his rant. And then God says, Okay, so here's some more grace. Verse 11. Then the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Okay. So all of this is what Elijah had expected the Lord to do. This was the kind of thing Elijah was used to. I mean, he was the type of believer who always wanted to see a move of the Spirit. As he defined it. However, God was not in the great rock crushing wind. Now think about that. How hard does the wind have to blow to break rocks in pieces? And he wasn't in the earthquake or the fire. See, just because there's a lot of movement, a lot of activity, a lot of visual, audio, and emotional stimulation, just because there's all types of movement and things going on, it does not mean that it's of the Lord, nor does it mean that God is in it. See, Elijah wanted to see all this great manifestations of movement and excitement and Things like that. But here before Elijah, the Lord moved in a still, small voice. Or is, is in the Hebrew, a voice of a gentle and delicate whisper. Oh. Oh. Oh, that's, that's not what Elijah was expecting. The scriptures tell us in John 3, 8 and in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, that the spirit moves as he wills. The Lord is not limited to movement according to the methods 
humans have designed for him. We got some Christians who say, God doesn't move at all, except for when I read the Bible. Others say, God moves in everything. What is that, Lord? Somebody, oh, somebody's going to give me $1,000 today. The Lord just spoke. And if, if you got the 1000 in your pocket and don't give it to me, you're going to hell. Others are like, unless you have a master's degree or higher, you can speak Hebrew and Greek, 16 letters behind your name, the Lord doesn't move. Now, maybe God may not be moving in you, but that's not meaning that he's not moving. He's never stopped moving. You know, some of the uh, my older brothers in Calvary, they, they're always talking about they want to see a move of the Spirit. And they talk about what happened in the hippie days. And the Spirit's not moving. And I'm like, well, you're discipling all these guys that you're raising up. And you're telling them they're serving in ministry without a move of the Spirit. How encouraging is that? I mean, it's like. Yeah, the spirit is not moving like it was in the old days. We want to see a move of the spirit, and you guys are in ministry. What? That's like, come on now. The spirit never stopped moving. What it is is you just got old and slowed down. <laughs> He's not in the wind. He's not in the earthquake. He's not in the fire. He's moving in a still, small voice. See, more often than we know, the Lord moves in what humans would label the small and insignificant. He moves in the small and insignificant by human standards far more often than him moving in what we would call the big, miraculous, and the extravagant. See, whether the Lord cracks the sky open and yells at you or just gently whispers in your ear, turn left at the stop sign. Every move of the spirit of God in our life is mighty in the miraculous. So after the wind, after the earthquake and after the fire, the Lord spoke to Elijah in a still, small voice. Verse 13 says, So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. Because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I am left, and they seek my life. I'm still gonna make my case. <laughs> now, if you look back at verse 11, the Lord told Elijah the first time, after the first time he gave his speech, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Now, whether Elijah was being stubborn or not, I don't know. But he didn't move from inside the cave where he was until he heard the Lord's still, small voice. And then I guess he sensed that the Lord was there, so he humbly covered his face in his mantle or with his cloak and went and stood in the entrance of the cave. So the Lord asked him a second time, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah answers the Lord verbatim what he answered him the first time. I mean, he had been working on this answer for over a month. <laughs> He'd been walking through the desert thinking about it. You know, it's probably what took him so long to get there from this two week journey to 40 days. 
But he had his argument down pat. Now, you guys are laughing, but you know you be having those arguments in your own head. What you going to say to somebody, and you're going to set them straight as soon as the opportunity comes. Well, Elijah had created the legend of himself within his own mind. How he was the world's greatest hero, the world's greatest victim, and the world's greatest villain all at the same time. The scriptures tell us in James 5, 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Mm -hmm. See, the thing about the nature of our emotions and self-reasoning is we can believe the lie of our own feelings so much so to the point we will state them to God as a matter of fact in protest to inform him of what he does not know. Say that again. I can't. <laughs> Elijah was basically informing God how the Lord had dropped the ball. See, God dropped the ball on his end, but Elijah's like, I was faithful in holding up my end. I was doing it all alone. Where were you? And then Elijah was like, look, Lord, check this out. I'm going to repeat myself since you didn't hear me twice the first time. I have been very zealous for the Lord. The children of Israel torn down your altars and forsaken your covenant. And it killed all your prophets and I alone. I'm the only one out here standing. And now they want to take my life. Where were you? Verse 15. Then the Lord said to him, go, return your way on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shephat, of Abel Manoah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Okay, so the Lord responds to Elijah's well-rehearsed defense with even more grace. For the second time, he did not address Elijah's well-rehearsed answer. Instead, the first thing the Lord said was, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive. See, because the Lord is not done with us, often when we mess up with God and veer off course, the Lord in his grace sends us right back to stand in faith to the place where we messed up for a restart and a clean slate. Hallelujah. In Elijah's case, it was before those who recently turned through the Lord to through his ministry and in Jezebel's face. In Micah 7, 8, it says, do not rejoice over me, my enemy, when I fall, for I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. And I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case and executes justice for me. He will bring forth the light and I will see his righteousness. Then she who is my enemy will see and she will cover herself with shame who said to me, where is the Lord your God? My eyes will see her and she will be trampled down like mud in the streets. Okay, so in my mind, Jezebel threatens Elijah and he runs off. And she's like, yeah, look at that Ahab. Where is the Lord? If he's all that. And then later on, when we get into 2 Kings, we'll see Jezebel did get trampled down in the streets. Anyway, 
I remember a while back having a conversation with a brother who was telling me he's going to leave perfect love um, because he had messed up here so much. And I told him, hey, remember, God sent Jonah right back to go. In other words, there's no better place for us to be than where you've messed up and everybody knows it. But it's the place where you've been loved, forgiven, and embraced. And that's so that you can get it right. But if you run off and go somewhere else where nobody knows you, all you do is give yourself the opportunity to recreate the same mess all over again. Anyway, he didn't listen. He left. But this is one of the reasons why so many Christians are tumbleweeds. Tumbleweeds and church hoppers. You go here, create some mess, do something, and instead of staying and dealing and changing, run off. Now, for me personally, I recently decided that I was going to change all my sayings and stop teaching people stuff because God keeps making me walk through everything that I say. <laughs> and then like always, he vetoed my plans. Okay, so there was three three anointings. God said anoint Haziel, anoint Jehu, and anoint Elisha. That was God's response to Elijah's well-rehearsed answer. He's like, check this out. I'm still God, and I'm still in the anointing business, and I'm going to use you to do it. Go anoint Haziel, Jehu, and Elisha. Now, between Elisha and Jehu, okay, I got it. Jehu is for Israel. Elisha was supposed to be the next prophet that Elijah was going to hand the baton off to. But I was wondering, why would God have his prophet go to a pagan nation to anoint its idol-worshiping king? And I couldn't figure it out. I, you know, I did some research, and I still wasn't getting the answer. But God gave me a couple months to work it out and think about it. And then he answered me from the scriptures. In Daniel 2, the Lord, it says the Lord changes times and the seasons. He removes kings and he raises up kings. And in Daniel 4, 17, it says, In order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men, and he gives it to whomever he wills. And he sets over it the lowest of men. That is the basis of men. And in Romans 13, it states, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And authorities that exist are appointed by God. In other, in other words, God is saying, Every office of authority and every ruler in those office of authority are ultimately placed there by me. Even the ones that are evil are the ones who have no idea what's going on or how they got there. <laughs> ultimately, I put them there. So I was like, okay, God, I got that. So why was one of the many purposes you appointed Haziel to rule Syria? And the Lord, again, answered from the scriptures. Haziel will be used by me as one of my three leading instruments to wipe out the family of Ahab and Jezebel plus extinguish Baal worship in Israel. Verse 17. 
the Lord says, It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elijah will kill. I'm going to deal with Ahab, Jezebel, and the Baal worship. It's just not going to happen the way you thought it was. Now, Elijah, I think Elijah was truly spent and burnt out. And God was like, okay, I got it. But you can't quit just yet. You're going to get Elisha to disciple him up to fulfill the ministry position that you're in. Now, when God spoke to Elijah, he put it in this order. Haziel, Jehu, and Elisha. But Elijah, what he did first was go anoint Elisha. We're going to see that next week. Um, but he's the only one that he anointed personally. I mean, I don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us. It may have been more important for him to get Elisha first and disciple him before anointing Hazel and Jehu. Or maybe Elijah was just being disobedient. Because, I mean, he, he's got a bad attitude. I mean, we're going to see he's, he keeps his bad attitude. I mean, he, he's not much of a people person. I don't think he liked anybody but the little boy in the, in the widows uh, where he was at. But he would eventually be succeeded by Elisha. And then Elisha, he's not going to anoint Jehu, he's going to send one of the junior prophets to do it. And then there's really no record of anybody anointing Hazael. Elisha, Elisha just told him, you're going to be the next king. But in both cases with um, Jehu and Hazael, when they received the news that they would be the next king, they both went and assassinated their own king and became the king. But none of that's going to happen for about 15 years or more from where we are. And that's going to be in 2 Kings. So, we'll meet Elisha next week. But for now, after graciously giving Elijah more work to do, <laughs> the Lord turns back to Elijah saying, Basically, back to your answer to my question. What are you doing here? Do you really think that you're filling me in on something that I don't know, Elijah? See, in Isaiah 40, 13, God asks, who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Or who has, as his counselor, taught him? And with whom did he take counsel? And who instructed him and taught him the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? You're like, Elijah, what are you telling me that I don't know? Do you really think you're filling me in on some information that I don't already have? You're not where you're supposed to be. And since you got a problem with what I'm telling you, In Isaiah 43, 26, the Lord states, put me in remembrance. Let us contend together and let us review the situation. State your case to prove your innocence that you can be acquitted. In other words, the Lord is like, here's the problem. Now, state your case so that you can be acquitted, that my charges don't stick. Basically, this is what we have to say. Lord, I'm guilty, and Christ is my only defense, and that's by your grace, right? So when you want to get to an argument with God about why it shouldn't be, or, you know, and you, God, you didn't see this piece of the information, or God is like, 
Listen, state your case so that you can be acquitted. Be your own lawyer. Defend yourself. Or just say, I'm guilty and Christ is my advocate. Now, remember, Elijah was here because he was not operating in faith. Once the disciples asked Jesus to increase their faith, and then he gave them a lesson on obedience as the only way of increasing our faith. In Luke 17, 7, Jesus said, Which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? But will you rather not say to him, after he's been plowing all day, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me until I have eaten and drunk. And then afterward, you can eat and drink. Now, after he's done all of that, does he thank that servant because he has done the things that were commanding him? I think not. So likewise, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. The Lord said, Elijah, check this out. I didn't ask you why you were here. I asked you, what are you doing here? I did not command you to leave Jezreel and to come way out here, nor did I ask you for your list of accomplishments. And as far as what you have done, it was your job. So get back to work, you unprofitable servant. Now, I could have chose anyone I wanted to do what I told you to do. But in response to your answer, verse 18 says, Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Elijah said, I've been very zealous for the Lord. You weren't nowhere around while I was doing your job. The children of Israel torn down your altars. They've forsaken your covenant. They killed your prophets. And only I am here doing the work. God's divine response and grace says, you're not the only one. I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. That's 7,000 men, not counting their wives and children that have been just as faithful as you. In fact, just as you yourself have twice testified, there were many other prophets and they were so faithful, they stood for the name of the Lord unto death. But you, were, you ran off and were able to hide and they didn't. Check this out, Elijah. You have elevated yourself and despised others because you say you're the only one standing. But you know what many of those prophets went through, including a hundred of them that old Obadiah told you about were hiding in a cave as I care for them and fed them through Obadiah with bread and water. You look down on them, but then when you ran off hiding, I fed you with bread and water. You're not the only one. Now, in closing, sometimes we can get the Elijah syndrome and think much too highly of ourselves. We can begin to believe our own press about how important and how great I am. And nobody is serving God on my level. Other times we can get the, I am of no importance and nothing that I'm doing for the Lord has any significance attitude. But in both cases, 
our perspective and focus are wrong. See, our focus should not be upon ourselves, but upon the Lord. The truth is, we are not so important that the Lord needs us because all of us are, irre are, are replaceable. And he can get done, things done without me being the one to do it. But on the other hand, we are not so insignificant that the Lord does not have deep personal involvement with us. The thing that is important is the Lord's work. And nothing that he has us doing is insignificant. See, when we feel like we're the world's biggest hero or the world's greatest victim and then try to run off and quit because things have not turned out the way I had in mind, that's when the Lord in his grace and in his love shows up with overwhelming love saying, it's not time to quit. I love you. You're my poem created for good works that I have prepared for you to walk in. And then he's like, besides that, it's over when I say it's over. And I got more work for you to do. So get up, stop crying, and let's get going to bless your brethren and strengthen them. Now, according to human standards, we may be looked upon as small and insignificant, but we're not to the Lord. It's the Lord and his work that are great. We have been privileged to be invited to the Lord's work. He created us as his poem to take part in adding color and flavor to his special great work. And because the Lord has concern for his great namesake, when we stumble, when we fall, when we run off high and quit, he pours out upon us more grace and sends us right back to the place of falling with a clean slate. Amen. Thank you, Father. He says it's not time to be on the bench. It's time to get back in the game. Amen. And he does this because he loves you. Because he is love. Because he is good. Because he is gracious and abounding in mercy. And that's so that he can establish before the eyes of all that you, that I, that we are his deeply beloved children. Aww. See, the Lord does this so that he can display his nature, that he alone is God. He does it so that he can put the mockers and accusers to shame. 2 Timothy 2.13 2 states, If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. And in Jeremiah 3.13, the Lord declares, With great love, filled with grace, Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you, and receive from me grace upon more grace. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, for your never-ending flow of grace upon more grace. We thank you for your, your mercy and your deliverance and your healing. We thank you for restoration and more work to do. So, Lord, give us... Um, the heart of Christ, to be diligent, to pursue all that glorifies you, to get our eyes off of ourself and put our eyes on your face. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.